to welcome to um, Darwin College uh, for this uh, event sponsored by the Center for Geopolitics um, for this book launch to hear and celebrate Patrick Kors's new book, uh, The New uh, Atlantic Order. Um, thanks so much to uh, so many of you for coming out on such a beautiful day in the middle of exam term when people are either writing exams or finishing up dissertations. Um, uh, or marking exams as I've been doing in marking dissertations. So thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come join us uh, for this event. My name is Andrew Preston. I teach history uh, here at Cambridge. Um, I specialize in American foreign policy in the 20th century and questions of world order, but also causes of war, causes of peace. Um, and I've been an admirer of Patrick's for uh, quite some time. And so when I learned that he was in the UK, um, in London and Oxford and elsewhere talking about his book, I thought, this would be a great opportunity to bring him here uh, to Cambridge and to celebrate this book. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do is introduce Patrick, say just a couple of words about the book, turn it over to him. He'll speak for 15 or 20 minutes or so. Um, and then we're going to hear from our uh, commentator on the book, Leslie Vinjamori, um, and I'll introduce her after Patrick speaks, but before uh, and before Leslie speaks. Uh, Patrick Kors is Professor of International History at the University of Florence, where he specializes in the history of modern international politics. He earned his DPhil at Oxford, where he was also then a research fellow, um, before becoming an associate professor at Yale, which is where I think we first, uh, we first met. And he's also held, held many fellowships in various places all over the world, including Harvard, the Humboldt, um, uh, in Japan, uh, and elsewhere. Patrick's first book... Oh, thanks. <laughs> this one here, which you can't hold. There's but also is, a paperback version of that. Yeah, which is also as big. Um, this is Patrick's first book, which is very heavy, also published by CUP, weighing in at a total of 707 total pages, um, is the unfinished piece after World War I. Um, and it approached a very familiar subject. Well, if you can see the height of it from there. Uh, it approached a very familiar subject from a new angle. Unfinished peace situated US and British policy at the heart of the post-World War I uh, settlement, not in 1919, but in 1924-25, and not in Paris or Versailles, but in London and in Locarno in Switzerland. Uh, and the unfinished peace argued that a stable post-World War I settlement only came into being five years after the war, and it was designed in London and Washington for the most part. Well, this argument challenged many shibboleths, not least in my own field, the supposedly isolationist Republicans of the 1920s, and forced us to rethink the whole era uh, of the First World War and how it was settled and then what it meant for the future of world order uh, after that. Now that book was published, this book here was published in 2006, 16 years ago. And I've often wondered what Patrick has been up to since. <laughs> I was wondering myself. Yeah. <laughs> Was waiting for that second book and it hadn't come. And I assumed he was simply resting on his laurels, <laughs> relaxing at the beach, visiting the Uffizi, or maybe enjoying himself at a vineyard in the Tuscan Hills. But no, he was busy writing this beast. The New Atlantic Order is Patrick's second book, weighing in at a total of 1,132 pages. In this monumental work of scholarship, he, re he returns to the scene of the crime of his first book, World War I and its discontents, especially the discontents of the post-war settlement. But he situates it this time in a much longer sweep of history, a 160 year period from 1860 to 2020 that he calls the long 20th century. It's more than twice as long as Eric Hobsbawm's short 20th century of 1914-1991 at 77 years. In his first book, Patrick took 620 pages of text to explain the complexities of 13 years of the First World War era. Um, and so uh, uh, in the New Atlantic Order, World War I is part of the story, uh, a major part to be sure, but just a part. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, it takes him just over a thousand pages, 1,005 pages to be exact, of text to tell this larger story of a new world order emerging from the ashes of the 19th century international system. It's an engrossing story. I can't say I've read all of it yet as we've just That's received copies recently. <laughs> but I have read enough of it to tell you that it's an engrossing story, but he's the best one to tell it. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Kors 
back to Cambridge. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this most generous uh, introduction. And um, I want to start with something that one of the protagonists of this book, a certain Woodrow Wilson, did not excel at. That is to manage expectations. <laughs> so I'm saying this because I've just had the thought have been fortunate enough to be on a US kind of book tour uh, where there were many book launches, but far fewer copies of the book in the actual rooms. But now um, one of them took place at Columbia. And I was debating this with a former colleague of mine from Yale, who was once a, a very important force at this university, Adam Toos. And I arrived in New York to see on the JFK book sort of, you know, uh, news agent, uh, a magazine with a cover where there was Adam's face and it was saying, I can explain everything. <laughs> so here, for, just to, you know, disappoint you at the beginning, I cannot explain everything. I cannot even explain the whole book. But what I want to try to do is to give you a sense of what this book really uh, wants to do. And to uh, add to what you said in your introductory remarks. So this is the second, but really the first volume of a trilogy. I'm, I've been fortunate enough to try to write with the help of a, a very understanding editor, um, a trilogy that maps this long 20th century. So it started with the unfinished piece. This is now the kind of foundational book on the origins of what this long 20th century was in my interpretation. And I'm now writing on the third and final volume, which is called Pax Atlantica, which takes us from 1933 to the post-World War II era to the 1960s, and then to an epilogue that was stretched from the 1970s to just about now. And so I think we are now at a time, uh, because of the war in Ukraine, because of the fundamental issues affecting the European Union, but also the United States. Will there be a United States? Yeah, that are a moment of crisis of um, where a lot of the old kind of ideas, assumptions, complacent you know, sort of attitudes are being put quite mercilessly to the test. And one of the things I think that's really on at stake at this point is the question whether the kind of Euro-Atlantic peace and security order that was eventually created after the Second World War, that was a big part of the world of the Cold War, but that had a long prehistory, which this book tries to illuminate in a new way, whether this kind of order can really survive, yeah? or whether we are in a period of corrosion where because of inner corruption, of failure of leadership, of problems of democratic government, you have challengers from without, like Putin, like the Chinese and others, who think that this era has come to an end. So I hope by the time I finish the next book, I can finish on a more optimistic note of lessons learned from a crisis. And this now takes me back 100 years, more or less. So not so long ago, we had the 100th anniversary of uh, the Paris Peace Conference. And a lot of new books came out, old books were reissued, but I, for one, felt that for the most part, it was a strangely uninteresting debate because you had a lot of the rehashing of old thesis, who was to blame for this bad piece, or the idea that it was just the best possible piece, it was just not enforced properly, yeah? and should have been enforced, especially towards the vanquished, uh, the German Empire, then turning into a very unstable, but perhaps quite hopeful, Weimar Republic. <laughs> and then you have new trends. So there is you know, new trends, national history, global history, that's trying to suggest, and rightly so, that what occurred in 1919 was a much more global, yeah? I don't like the word moment, but a global phase of yeah, the whole world thinking, or many people in different parts of the world, in the so-called col col colonial world, in the world that was at that point still under the thumb of different forms of imperial <laughs> domination, including China. Yeah, that now a time had come where, because of the nature and the depth of the catastrophe that had also destroyed a lot of European empires in the East, but had also delegitimized, so it seemed, others, <laughs> that now the time had come for what Woodrow Wilson, who I mentioned earlier, called a new world order. So this book tries to explain how far it was actually possible to build such a new world order and why 
the, the attempts that were made were considerable, <laughs> but in the end, very limited. And why ultimately not a very durable new international order could emerge and especially not a very legitimate international order that could be legitimate beyond the interest of the victors, the Western powers, the United States and the British and French imperial powers, but also legitimate for the vanquish that was supposed to be integrated, the question of what would happen with Russia, yeah, then in 1919, still in the throes of civil war, and of course for the vast part of, you know, all those parts of humanity that like Indian nationalists, like Koreans, like many others were saying, we want some people now to take seriously all this rhetoric about self-government, self-determination and participation in this new peace. So the book basically tries to suggest that we need to reevaluate all of this. And this is part four of the book, but the wider intervention is in a way uh, is to try to suggest that if we want to understand what was possible and what was not possible after the First World War, we have to widen the scope of inquiry yeah, considerably. And I've tried to do this in my first book, but I've tried to go a bit further this time. Um, so I basically argue that what we need to understand, and this is the, the idea of the long 20th century, is that yeah, we have two, I would say, reigning kind of modes of interpretation. Yeah? There's a very uh, excellent, sophisticated scholarship on the long 19th century. Eric Hobsbawm started this in some ways. Jürgen Osterhammel, I think, wrote the definite, almost definitive work for now on the transformation of the world. Yeah? This takes us from the age of the Atlantic revolutions in the, in the late 18th century towards 1920. Yeah? But this is a world that is very yeah, incredibly interesting in its transformation. But for Osterhammel, it would end with very major imperial powers being the leading kind of actors. Yeah? Whereas if you take my approach, then you would focus on the fact that a lot of these empires would be dissolved within a rather short time afterwards. So question, you need a different framework. So this is one yeah, of my kind of engagements. The other one I would briefly call an engagement with the uh, the idea of the short 20th century, that's the Hobsbawm idea, and more broadly, the idea of the, the 20th century as marked by the Cold War. Yeah, so my, by now, by nowadays, think of Arnie Westart's work on the global Cold War. It's the most sophisticated way of saying this is the central conflict of the 20th century. And the idea has been to look at its origins and to go ever further backwards to see where are the origins of this kind of clash eventually between a yeah, more liberal capitalist American form of future and a Bolshevik socialist Russian uh, sort of trajectory. I argue that this is interesting, but it's very shaped by a generational interest in the Cold War. And it's too narrow, <laughs> if, you mind my, if you don't mind my saying so, because it seems to, yeah, to, to have a lens that looks towards an almost inevitable clash. Yeah? So you go from Wilson and Lenin towards Truman and Stalin and so on. And this has been globalized, but still the main ideas are it's, it's this systemic competition. So my uh, interpretation tries to be broader <laughs> yeah? and it tries to link European, Euro-Atlantic, transatlantic history with global history. So why the long 20th century? I argue that what we had in the 19th century was eventually after the French and American revolutions and the period of the Napoleonic Wars, a very Eurocentric, yeah, kind of Europeanized world order where you had the Vienna system emerging as Paul W. Schroeder has shown in his uh, heartbreaking work. Um, a, a new kind of mode of a European concert of avoiding war, of trying to mediate conflicts through concerted action, of integrating powers like Imperial Russia, with Britain playing a hegemonic role of a, of a kind for some time. So this uh, system uh, was, of course, not governing the whole world. Mark Mazawa has tried to show the limits of this. But um, as Jürgen Ostermann uh, argued, and I agree with that, you had certain spheres of order. You had the European idea that they were setting the terms of world politics. You had the, um, the United States benefiting from this because nobody was trying to conquer them after 1812. 
And, but you had many others not being in the club where rules and understandings and decisions were made, most of the rest of the world. So by the mid 19th century chronologically, which I call the dawn of the long 20th century, very dynamic processes uh, begin that um, are essential for our understanding of the origins of the Great War and the possibilities of peacemaking and reordering in its aftermath. And I would go even further that set up the scene for not the 30 years war of the 20th century, uh, as it's sometimes been called, this idea that you have one continuous war, 1914 to 1945, with the German question at the center, and an almost inevitable you know, sort of uh, second stage of this fight when Hitler comes to power and so on. And we, we might discuss this further. I uh, posit against that, uh, a kind of 60 years reorientation learning process, a dialectic between attempts to build a new order, failures, limitations, crisis, Great Depression, the 1930s, and then another iteration of a learning process that eventually, not yet in Potsdam in 1945, but from the late 1940s and then towards the early 1960s, uh, creates the basic architecture of a, an Atlantic order, yeah? not a new world order, but an Atlantic order in which the United States plays a very important hegemonic role, in which nonetheless, Europe, uh, certain European states are partners, not subjects of a new American empire, but rather partners of a hegemonic kind of uh, peace system. This would find its expression, for example, in the North Atlantic Alliance, in the, the structures of what some people then call an Atlantic community. I'm trying to suggest then that something very particular and unprecedented <coughs> occurred in the, U, in the North Atlantic sphere. Yet, very importantly, this had implications for the entire world. You know, in many, many ways, I cannot all uh, go into, but it set certain standards for the rest of the world, but it also showed and accentuated hierarchies, hierarchical understandings of certain rules that apply to certain parts of the world community, not to others. And this had its origin in my uh, interpretation in this new attempt after the tremendous unprecedented catastrophe of the Great War to build a new order with immense expectations, yeah? a peace to end all wars, uh, 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 you know, something that would uh, prevent one thing above all, a recurrence of the catastrophe of the Great War. Yeah? So what then occurred? This is part three and four of the book. Um, uh, what I try to show is that those who were the main actors in this reordering process yeah, were, in the end, while you had many new transnational activists and people who were, who were in favor of a League of Nations, of international law, yeah, many of them trying to shape the peace process afterwards, what really drove this was a new kind of um, very complex three-level negotiating process between some actors that had done this for many, many years and had machineries and had, you know, had bureaucracies, had experts uh, that were ready at hand to pursue imperial national interest and you know, uh, more global concerns, Britain and France, and a new, very untested, very untried power that had risen through the Great War to a, city, so to a position of preeminence you know, financially, economically, but that in terms of sharing responsibilities in the international system was an absolute novice, even more so the United States had made it its game to opt out of most of responsibilities. Yeah? So if you think of the Monroe Doctrine, it had pursued very unilateral or exceptionalist is insulationist policies. And now all of a sudden you have a president arguing that the time had come to shift from exceptionalism being the shining example to the rest of humanity towards exemplarism. Yeah, yet Wilson, in my view, embodies the kind of provincialism and lack of experience of this whole yeah, American uh, progressive elite that because of Wilson's victory in the, in the elections was called upon after 1916 to try 
uh, led Wilson to raise immense expectations that he could not at all fulfill because contrary to what many, especially political scientists have suggested, the US was not at all in a position to set the terms by you know, kind of powerful fiat from above. Wilson originally came to Europe and thought he could build this transnational coalition of the most progressive people. They would put pressure on Yeah, the whole range of assumptions and of rhetoric yeah, that uh, made it very hard for them, if you think of the French, to see how they could gain real assurance of security vis-a-vis -vis Germany in the future. Yeah? So nonetheless, uh, the book tries to show that this, is, this did not make for a, a piece that was bound to fail. I just try to show that uh, it made for us a, a scenario in which uh, this peace and reordering settlement that took that was crafted in some ways in that, around 1919 had to be very limited in fundamental ways. It was limited in the terms of the fragility of the kinds of agreements these actors could make. Uh, so they were trying to set rules for the entire world. In reality, they were setting rules mainly for Europe and for the Euro-Atlantic world. And then they created a mandate system that yeah, was a, a, a new imperial device that uh, especially British and French actors uh, got the Americans to, yeah, to, to basically legitimize. Um, and, uh, and they did not order much at all. Uh, if you think of the reordering of, uh, of Eastern Europe, think of the case of Ukraine. You had Ukrainian nationalists who said, not only a new Poland should emerge, but a new Ukraine. For these peacemakers, they were overburdened with so many other issues, especially the Polish-German question. They simply let, let the, the Ukrainians sort of outside their perimeter. So this is one of the, the, yeah, the, the, the things. So sort of what we have to understand is that this was an immensely complex peacemaking process, the most complex in history. And because of that, in part, they did not get to some of the essential tasks. And the most essential task in, the, in such a piece, I would I argue in this book, is you have to find a way to integrate the vanquished yeah, and those that are not part of your ordering process. So Wilson started out saying, we have to make a modern piece, not a piece of the victors, but what occurred was a piece of the victors. The League of Nations was founded not as an universal, as an integrative institution, but as an institution of the victors. And Wilson eventually changed his uh, legitimation strategy. He said, others like the Germans first have to be put on probation. You know, they have to show that they are attached to democratic ideals and they have to fulfill all the, the terms that the victors imposed on them. This was very heavy burden. This posed very heavy burdens, not so much on, also on German society, but also on those aspiring social democrats and liberals who were trying to negotiate with the Western powers a new order in which Germany would find a place. Then think of the question of Russia. Yeah, so nothing of a fundamental nature could be decided yet in 1919. So finally, uh, there's also the question of what are the underlying mentalities, as I mentioned. So I'm, the book tries to delineate that rather than yeah, a kind of big change of mind, of men mental change. The Great War produced a lot of new rhetoric, but the, some, many of the main assumptions of the key actors, not just in Europe and the United States, but also in Japan, in China and elsewhere, were still very hierarchical and pre-1914. Yeah? So uh, this was a struggle for a new hierarchy in the world. This was not the struggle for a new egalitarian world order. Yeah? So there was a big chasm between the rhetoric and the, uh, the actual sort of decisions and the nature of this peace settlement, which leads me to the final sort of arc of the book. Um, so one of the, the, the ideas the book tries to uh, accentuate is that 
given the atrocity, the, the colossal nature of the destruction and the catastrophe that the Great War represented for societies. Look at Britain, yeah, look at many others. These millions of dead, uh, the, yeah, the absolutely unforeseeable kind of nature of this war, but not only because of that, <laughs> but also because the peacemakers of 1919 had to deal with a legacy of Un, sort of almost unlimited imperial competition and mentalities that were shaped by civilizational Darwinism and a fight for who could be at the top, who could be a rising instead of a dying nation. Yeah? So in creating the foundation or laying foundations for a new order, they did not just have to settle the issues that the war had produced, they had to, they had to take on a fundamental task that, and that's why you need parts one and two of the book to show that yeah, this is, these are developments that had reshaped the world since the 1860s. Yeah, this dynamic competition between states that were modernizing, that were mobilizing their po populations, and that had sort of at some point all accepted not just the German, yeah, reconstituted German uh, uh, empire, but also the reunited states after the Civil War, Britain, France, Russia, and Japan as the only non-Western power playing this game. Yeah, sort of a game where you had to be a world power if you wanted to be among the top in the future. And if you didn't, could not manage that, think of Salisbury's famous speech, you would be among the dying nations. Uh, in his view, the dying nations were mainly Catholic and Southern, yeah, and it's, it's, it's the Protestant or the kind of, you know, invited Protestant Japanese powers that, that would rule the world in the future. Yeah, so I'm trying to show in the in the second, uh, especially in the first, and sorry, in the first part, in the second part, sorry, I'm mixing it up. The second part, <laughs> I'm trying to show, yes, yes, I don't know what this book is, but. <laughs> um, uh, so in the second part, um, I'm engaging a lot, and I'm, I'm sad that he can't be here today because it would have been an interesting debate. I'm trying to show, and I, and, and I, I think uh, Christopher Clark's work on the sleepwalkers is a very interesting and influential, but I argue in my book that there were not many sleepwalkers at all. Yeah, they, they were sleepwalkers, those actors before 1914, in my view, in the way in that they could not imagine really envisage what kind of <laughs> war would actually occur when they unleashed all their potentials. But they were not sleepwalkers in my view, in the sense that they made many, they, they made strategies, they made decisions, they were maneuvering. Yeah, they, um, in 18, 48, they still had something like a European concert that could be invoked at a time of crisis, and then you could have a peaceful settlement. By 1914, Sir Edward Grey famously said, why don't we call all the interested parties to London? We have something like a European concert. We can deal with this. We can prevent an escalation. Yet what occurred? The concert was a hollow shell by this time. You had competing alliances. You had understandings. Yeah, Paul Schroeder has called this, and I call it quite similarly, they had unlearned what to do to preserve peace. They had learned what to do to potentially win a big war. And they were mistaken about that too. Yeah? So when Gray called this conference, nothing really came of it. And then you have the escalation scenario of the July crisis. So this we have to understand, not just the 1914, but we have to go back in time yeah, to understand the kind of legacy, the problematic legacy of the dawn of the long 20th century. So the next book then will take up this uh, story. I call it history. I don't like the word story at all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so in trying to suggest that when we think of when such a more durable, more legitimate Euro-Atlantic order actually could be created, it was after 1945, not only because of the pressures of the Cold War. Yeah, again, I think this Cold War paradigm is important, but it's been overemphasized. I think I'm trying to think of many of the actors that are in this book. One a very important Cambridge figure, John Maynard Keynes. They are present in 1919. They are thinking about the new world order in 1916. They've lived through the crisis, and, but also the achievements of the 1920s. They see the big crisis of the 1930s, and then they think, what can we do differently and better next time? Yeah? So this is what my next book, I hope, can show, that if we want to understand what the NATO and kind of the Pax Atlantica and this Atlantic community was, we cannot just say this is a product of the Cold War, there is a lot of that, yeah. 
but it also is the is the the outgrowth of a longer term learning process yeah so in the book i put it this way the for all its destructiveness the first world war was too short and too massive to engender real learning it took a much longer time of yeah further crisis and even more atrocious war to get us to the kind of situation we faced the United States and the Europeans with global implications in the late 1940s and thereafter. And so finally, the question is, are we right now in a phase where the current leadership in major Western powers, think of the great Anglo-American powers or others, <clears throat> are allowing the kind of achievements that were made with a lot of blood, with a lot of sacrifice, to be withered away, yeah, to be to be taken up, taken over by no one really caring anymore, making pragmatic deals of you know uh, underpinned by populist rhetoric. Is this the time we're in, or are we in the end in a new phase of learning, which we I think really need to try to revitalize and strengthen not just the Euro-Atlantic order, but if we're serious about it, certain standards, certain rules that should apply to the whole world and not just to some. Yeah, not just to the Ukrainians, but not to the Russians, not just to the Euro-Atlantic peoples, but not to the Chinese. And this is a gigantic challenge. And that's why the next book, I promised Michael, that will be a really substantial book. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks so much for, Pat, uh, for that, Patrick. Um, I'm, I'm sort of grappling with the idea of a longer of a longer book. No, no, not longer. <laughs> you, did, you said substantial. And, uh, no, it's quality, this, not this, quantity. This um, so as Patrick was mentioning, uh, we were supposed to have two commentators tonight. Um, one of those commentators was going to be Professor Chris Clark, um, my colleague here in the history faculty. Um, he can't be here because he's been caught up, as I'm sure you've seen, um, in the travel chaos uh, with a lot of flights canceled and trains delayed. He is currently in Germany. Um, and can't be here tonight because of that, because EasyJet basically let him down. And there is something comforting, I think, to think that even the Regis professor is caught up in the, in the travails of EasyJet that sort of affects us all. What's uh, happened to I feel, Cambridge? I'm yeah, well, well, I think that's on Freiburg, not us. But um, so uh, I do feel sorry for Chris, um, and it's a shame that he can't be here. But he really did want to. Uh, he did really want to be here. Um, but we do have our, uh, our other commentator, Leslie Vinjimori, and I'd like to introduce her now before turning things over to her for some comments, and then we'll open it up for a uh, general uh, Q&A. Uh, so also joining us tonight um, to offer her insights on the book is Leslie Vinjimori, uh, Director of the US and the Americas Program and Dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership in International Affairs at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, much better known as Chatham House. Um, and I, um, uh, sorry, and she also teaches international relations at SOAS uh, at the uh, University of London. Um, Leslie and I have met several times over Zoom, uh, where we've both been participants on various panels. I think one of them was at the Cambridge Union. Is yeah, that right? We, yeah. Where we lost, we were on the losing side oh, of, of a debate. Very bad yeah, we were on the <laughs> losing side of a debate over the future of the United States. Uh, the motion was something like. This house believes. Is there a future for the yeah, United is this States? basically is there a future of the United States? Will there be a United States, as Patrick touched on in his own talk? And Leslie and I were arguing against the motion that implied that there wouldn't be a future for the United States. We thought there would be, and overwhelmingly we lost. So it was a depressing night. That was on Zoom, however. It's um, during the pandemic. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to meet her in person, to welcome her to Cambridge um, in person. Leslie holds a PhD from Columbia, um, and she is a fellow of all sorts of various distinguished institutions for world affairs, international relations, and, and so forth, um, including but not limited to the US Study Center at the LSE and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. She's written widely on the concept of and practice of international order and human rights and liberal internationalism in the 20th century, and I can think of no better commentator um, for Patrick's book. So, Please join me in welcoming Leslie Vinjimori to Cambridge. 
Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be on this panel with you, Patrick. It's an honor to see the book um, in, in real life because I've had the e-copy. Um, and it's really, it's great to meet you, Andrew, in person. So and I, I had forgotten about the, the dreaded Cambridge. The timing of our position was especially difficult because I think it came before rather than after the election, right. if I remember. Mm -hmm. And when, when many people thought maybe the, the result would go the other way. Um, including Donald Trump on, on January 6th, um, which is a sad but dark, you know, one has to laugh at, at a certain moment. Uh, so the, the, the book is magisterial, and you're at the severe disadvantage of having uh, somebody speak about it in the first instance, although you have a, an extraordinary audience in front of us um, who comes at this from the relation, uh, from the perspective of international relations, uh, from the perspective of being deeply steeped in the current moment, and having, um, of course, as, as all good students of international relations have studied the interwar period, first world and all the rest of it, but not being um, expert in the way that you have. And maybe the, the, the disadvantage, the advantage of that is that, you know, forgive me the detail. Um, and I might just sort of ask a few questions uh, about the story, the history that you tell, which is phenomenally, um, for those of you who haven't yet uh, bought it or, or gotten your hands on it, it's very well written. It's extremely engaging. I said to somebody as I was turning to it again last night, I'm in my happy space um, because it's really a beautiful, informative, rich read where you feel like you're in your kind of arguments, but you're also learning and, and being told something in a way that just takes you from page to page. I think you can stop now. I, I, really, I, really, I, really, I felt like I'm really in my happy space. It was a, it's, it, it's a, it's a very, very compelling read. Um, I do have, you know, I guess a, a few different questions and, and comments. And, and also just to say a few things that really jumped off the page at me, partly because I think they're so relevant in our current moment, which I would argue is an extended moment in which we're confronting the fundamental challenge of international order. Um, and, you know, just to mention a couple of things that really jumped off the page. One was the, the failure, as you put it, I guess, of Woodrow Wilson to manage expectations, right? That there had been this enormous, for a variety of reasons, but there was this enormous expectation on what could be delivered. And, and I think that we certainly see for multiple reasons that we're in a period of, we've been in an extended period of, of heightened expectations. And, and you tell the story very well of how um, it, it was basically going to be impossible to meet those expectations in that 1919 moment. So let me come to that um, in a moment. The second thing that really stood out to me is this question of legitimacy. And again, I think it's absolutely critical today. And I wouldn't mind hearing you say more about it when we come back to the conversation because it would be it would be very interesting to understand more about what you think legitimacy derives from other than people thinking that something is legitimate and in particular of course you know two things uh, i think stand out one is to what extent does legitimacy derive from triumphant power and predominant power we know it doesn't always but sometimes that's an, perhaps a necessary but not sufficient condition um, and, and to what extent, and I heard this, somebody say this even yesterday about the, sang to the sanctions on Russia and the approach to Russia, as I'm sure you have many times. Um, to what extent does legitimacy in the end stem from effectiveness and success? And so this is, I think, a big question um, that I have about how you assess legitimacy of the order that was trying to be created, but didn't successfully uh, transition, as you set it out, from a European order to a transatlantic order in that moment, but it eventually did. Um, and I guess that takes me to a sort of a third comment, which is, you know, which is about power. And, I, you know, people in my field who are forever derided by people in your field, I was one of those Columbia PhDs who went back and forth to Yale for the IR, you know, okay. history series that Bob Jervis, my very dear and beloved um, a mentor who's no longer with us, sadly, but would definitely want to be in this room right yeah. now. I have We'd the pleasure right of discussing here. this in its early phases. <laughs> okay, him, well, so I'm, nice. I'm definitely not surprised. Um, but, you know, a lot of people would look at your book. I don't think I'm one of them, but a lot of people in my field would look at your book and they'd say, of course, it didn't work in 1919 because the U.S. hadn't really become as powerful. You know, it really was truly hegemonic. Mm -hmm. 
and triumphantly powerful in 1945. And until that had been worked out, you're never going to get, because the story that you seem to tell about 1919 is, you know, on one level, there are, there are a number of European powers plus the United States who had very different interests. They wanted very different things. And I think you don't quite say it, and nobody was actually strong enough to impose what they wanted on. on it. So uh, wait, hold, hold on that, hold on that. So yeah, that's a question you're for you. You'll have, you'll have a chance to. You want us to yeah. come back to it, and like I said, this is not, you know, this. Is It's in there, but I kept thinking, why 2020? Why didn't you end it in 2020? Because you know, a lot of people would say it ended in 2016, and the markers were, you know, the, the major leading democracies basically really giving up on it. Donald Trump and Brexit. Others would say it really ended in with a with Obama, who basically looked at the world and went, "We need a new, we need a new way of doing politics, and it needs to be realist and pragmatic, and we need to recognize that there's a different balance of power." Others might say, you know, it was COVID and it was Biden because when Biden enters office, China has 16, uh, has 16 percent of the global, uh, the world GDP. And when 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 um, when Obama comes in with that same notion, really still China only has nine percent of GDP. So there's a fundamental shift in, in, in the balance of power at least in economic terms. And that's a big part of the story. So but what I really want to ask you about is the current period. Because you do say all these things, and which are very astute, and they again they fit uh, into our more sort of clean, or you might say simplistic theories of international relations. When you say you know there really needed to be what what failed in 1919 was the integrative approach. At one point you say the ECSC was a really creative and intelligent solution, and what eventually became NATO really wasn't. That's how I read it. Wasn't quite so creative or intelligent. It was more, you know, mm -hmm. collective. Okay, so and we'll come back to that. You'll get, you'll get yeah, your we'll chance. You'll get your chance. But on, on the integrative question, um, what do we do now? Right? And and two, there are two questions. One is China and one is Russia. Bob Zelik had a very specific answer to the China question. It was the integrative solution. China was at a, around one or two percent of the world's GDP when um, when Clinton and Zelik decided to bring it into the WTO. Okay, it came in a little bit late. Um, and the responsible stakeholder thesis, some people, including Zelik, still defend it, and they still say China's trying to be part of this international order. But most people think it, you know, it radically failed, and it failed largely because A, we didn't change the rules, that would fit your, your argument, but also because China's just become so powerful that it doesn't need to play by these rules. It wants a different rule. It wants more seat at the table. Maybe, maybe it's only performative that it's even engaging in the order at all. So what about China? And I guess the second uh, question is, is the big one, uh, and it's Russia. Hmm. And you know what some people have argued have gotten a uh, huge amount of press. John Mearsheimer, I think that John Mearsheimer's argument is not a realist argument, but it is a very important argument. And there are others around the edges that make that argument, perhaps in a more nuanced way, the failure of integration. Um, so there's that moment, but there's also the current moment. And it's the sanctions question. And it's the war, to, to quote the Foreign Affairs article that was just published a couple of days ago. There's a section in there. It's, um, is it Michael Kimmage? I haven't, I haven't read it. Yet, right? Right? It's, yeah, it's, oh, Michael Kimmage. Yeah, 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 and he yeah. says, you know, part of it, he says the war after the war. And there is this, you know, there is this question of Russia and European security. And so I, I wonder if, you know, your broader argument, the themes, I know that, you know, history doesn't work. Um, I mean, you can't just pretend that it all plays out again, but what, what is your thinking about that order? And then finally, do we now need to move from an Atlantic order to an international order? And how do you do that when much of the rest of the world actually doesn't want to be part of an extended Euro-Atlantic um, order? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll stop there. <laughs> 
That's great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks so much, Leslie. Yeah. So just pick one thing, only one thing that Leslie <laughs> said to respond to. I'm sure you can yes. smuggle a response into some of the other points in the yeah, Q&A, but I do want to hear from the audience. Okay. I, would, I would say in her, in Leslie's defense um, about the question of power is I thought the same thing as I was reading it. And I thought a lot about Kindleberger and I thought mm -hmm. a lot about hegemonic stability theory. I thought a lot about yeah. the World War I order, the post-war order, that um, Britain couldn't uphold order, mm -hmm. um, America wouldn't. And to me, that did seem central to what yeah. I was reading in, in, in the book. Yeah, so um, Although you let, let, me, let, 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 me, yeah. let mm -hmm. me face that head on and combine four of these. So, <laughs> because it's really, you, you picked out exactly very yes. essential points. And so uh, I leave expectations aside, but, but, but allow me one footnote on that. So I, uh, I'm one of the historians I'm most in dialogue with and who's been most influential for me is Thucydides. Yeah? And so for this, yeah, he has a very important lesson for expectations. It's those who create them and they are, have a responsibility, but it's also those who accept them and who lead, yeah, who are the, the societies, the wider audiences, public opinion, that, for example, in 1919 was waiting for this messiah from uh, the United States and was placing a lot of unrealistic expectations on him that were partly influenced by, uh, uh, this is chapter seven, a gigantic ideological war yeah, in which all the governments to keep up the war effort had raised many expectations yeah, of social change, of of, of new economic opportunities and of retribution and of, you know, of, of the other side being the villain that finally had to pay and so on. And so you have these, this welter of clashing expectations and uh, in, the, in defense of Wilson, he was the one who most effectively used these and he, but he could not have controlled them. Yeah? So I'm also trying to show that it's not just his fault or you cannot just blame yeah, the, the few statesmen or the people at the top. Yeah, this is a much broader question. So um, on legitimacy, power, and what really makes a modern international order. So this is at the core of the book, um, pages one through 12, I think. I'm trying to lay out exactly this at the beginning. So if you, if you think I never read this book, read those pages and then decide whether you want to read on. <laughs> and, and on that, so uh, this is so important because this argument, it's not called the new American peace. It's not called Pax Americana because the, one of the main arguments in this book is that it was, would neither have been realistic nor desirable for Wilson or the United States to impose yeah, new rules because this would have been very illegitimate. There were some who were hoping for this, but what really I'm trying to look at is, so legitimacy has something to do with ideas that gain currency, that gain traction, that reach people, be effective rules, mechanisms that actually, for example, can preserve peace. So if you think of the League of Nations, yeah, so a lot of what we think about the League has to do with its track record. But if you want to understand why the League was so limited in its possibilities, you have to understand US policy towards it, the British policy, and the kind of creation of the League that did not set it up as the great global institution that some wanted it to be. For example, Jane Addams and the Women's Peace Party or the League of Nations you know, group pressure groups in Britain. So more importantly though, I argue, this is maybe a bit Kantian for some, yeah, that, that modern legitimacy has a lot to do with process, with yeah, allowing actual agency of those who are interested in a particular problem, the victors and the vanquished, the colonizers and the colonized, to try to work out common understandings to mediate between very clashing interests. So, and this is exactly, if there was a core of legitimacy that arose in 1919, it's a kind of negotiation process. But of course, it's one heavily yeah, influenced by those who negotiate at the very center. Yeah, so in 1919, you have a general assembly, you have a woman's peace congress, you have an African peace congress, you have many others who try to say, this has to be more global. Yeah? Whereas Wilson comes to Paris and says, this will now be a peace of the peoples. But that is rhetoric. So the actual process was one of high level negotiations between democratically elected, not very democratically elected by the male white population in their respective countries who had enough money, yeah? but nonetheless representing more democratic states in which they had to yeah, 
find common ground. And that was very complex. They had to uh, sort of agree on what kind of league they wanted, for example. They also had to see, will this find support in their respective parliaments? What will happen in the parliaments and the public opinion of their opponents yeah, or of their interlocutors? So it's this complex modern process of politics. And it's a process. So the my uh, uh, sort of the title of this book could have been the Atlantic reordering, yeah, because it's much more about a process than a fixed <coughs> order. Because this is exactly one of the fallacies, in my view, of a lot of the scholarship on 1919. Either it was a good piece or a bad piece. Yeah, I argued that it was just the beginning, and this is how Wilson, Lloyd George, for example, and Clemenceau each defended the piece. They all said it's the beginning of a beginning. But unfortunately, the way in which they crafted it in the end, yeah, under a lot of pressure, made it a very kind of inauspicious beginning, yeah, because they still had to tackle a lot of the key problems later on. And while they were trying to do that, Wilson lost his support at home. So America was out of the picture as the key proponent of this order. Um, and uh, imagine what, what kind of yeah, shock waves the Paris peace settlement sent in the wider world. Yeah? Think of Ho Chi Minh, think of the Chinese uh, uh, Republic. Yeah, all those who tried to be part of this and were then relegated to yeah, the periphery again. So this has a long shockwave through the long 20th century. But of course, in, in particular, I was recently in, in Hungary, think of Trianon, yeah? think of the Hungarian kind of uh, resentment and, and, and feeling yeah, that they have been a, a dictated peace has imposed, been imposed on them. Similarly, uh, Austria, but of course the Austrian Republic only had one way of influencing world politics to send one Austrian to Germany. Yeah, and it's Germany that is the, the key problem here. And, and, and here I'm trying to show not in the old, yeah, I, I, I really detest blame game history. Yeah, so of this, oh, it wasn't the French, it was the British, or it's, uh, this way. Yeah, I'm trying to sense, look at the bigger picture, but I would argue that one of the key problems of this yeah, whole peacemaking process is that you have expectations that were raised that anyone who was willing to subscribe to certain standards, rules, also of democracy, would be part of this new order, would be part of the League of Nations. And classically, I mean, this is the, at the core of the problem, in the end, for reasons I've already outlined, the Germans are not part of it. And this, of course, gives a lot of you know, sort of ammunition, not to those who want a republic in Germany, not to those who want to integrate with the West, but to those who, like Ludendorff and Hindenburg and others, say that we have to be better prepared to win the next war. And to younger, you know, sort of a young corporal who gets into a milieu where he gets many ideas of this is just a perfidious you know, kind of Anglo-American way of ruling and, and lording their order on us Germans. So on a more sophisticated level, think of Max Weber, yeah, a very important uh, character in this book, who is a very influential voice of liberal German modernization, but who also um, thinks of this piece as the most illegitimate piece possible and says at the same time, what we see now is the rise of a new Rome, a new Roman empire, it's the United States. And so this is how he conceives this. Think later of a certain Carl Schmitt. Yeah? He's not an original thinker on this. He, he adopts a lot of the ideas that the, that the generation of Max Weber utter, basically saying, when the British and when the Americans talk about liberalism, of universalism, of human rights, they are just, this is just a smoke screen. They just want to rule over the world. Yeah? And then that's how the, the whole Schmittian yeah, kind of counter uh, dimension that, that also reverberates through the 20th century and is still uh, has a lot of revival again and again uh, against anyone who was trying to accuse the, you know, the, the sort of the hypocrisy, the double standards of the Westerners. Yeah? And, and this is something that is intimately connected to the way in which this piece was made and not made in the end. Yeah? And so this is something that has many implications for the present, but that I'm not allowed to talk about. Well, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> let's hear, let's first, let's first um, hear from the audience. Um, floor is open for, for, for questions. Okay, why don't we start with Naman and Brenda. Uh, my question is, um, how much of the problems in forming a new uh, order were the result of contradictory promises made during the war itself? For mm -hmm. example, 
Sykes Picot on one hand, Balfour Declaration, and yes, yes. the Hashemites. Yes, and was that applies in Europe as well? Yeah, that that has a lot to do with it. So there, there's this, um, I have, you know, three rather major chapters on the war itself, and I'm trying to show that you know because of the unprecedented, unexpected nature of the war, all of the governments, yeah, in in, in their different ways, uh, had to find ways to mobilize populations and to uh, think of them giving sort of to make sense of a senseless war, yeah, and to to find some aims that that would make it worth it. And so in the imperial mindset, and if you think of someone like Curzon or others, of course, what you get out of a war is more control over you know, the, the key nexus of the British world system. So they, if they could have you know, got their head their way, and I, I described that uh, in detail, they would have liked to extend this towards the Caucasus, and you know, they, there was no stopping them. Uh, whereas others thought that this would be a bit hard to police uh, in the longer run. Yeah, so the French, I mean, they have a nightmare on their doorstep. Uh, Northern France is devastated, but of course they have to remain a world power. So the most rigidly imperialist power that has little to show, you know, except for a few Senegalese troops uh, that will then police the rule is France. So any idea that there will be decolonization or yeah, uh, uh, allowing the French uh, colonies to gain, to gain independence is far from their radar, and they have the power to uh, block a lot of that. And Wilson, as, as you might know, he was, you know, he, he had not thought through uh, a lot of the implications of his rhetoric. So when he, yeah, he, he found himself in a classic uh, bind, he wanted to get the league accepted. And in order to do that, he had to make many concessions. So because because it made it, it was very easy for his uh, sort of in his his friends, so to speak, to say yes, we like your league very much, but you know uh, we need to have particular rules here for the the wider Middle East. You're not so used to this, you Americans, but we know how to deal with this. And then you have this miraculous, you know, kind of turnout that. Yeah, uh, you know, you, Britain gets yeah the, the the things that were already in undersized pico, but on an, in a new kind of framework, and so does France. So all of these, um, yeah, and, and this extends across the board. Yeah, so some of the worst, uh, so so the the weaker government is, the more it engages in uh, sort of unrealistic expectations. Think of the German expectations. So they were promising the Germans control over you know from Calais to the Caucasus and the, you have ideas of an Eastern Empire you have all these you know completely outlandish uh, uh, conceptions that we might say oh you can see already what Hitler will do later but I see it rather from the yeah chronologically at that time you have a lot of pub publicists like the young Stresemann writing this because he knew Ludendorff would like it yeah but the idea to that well, that's been recently suggested by a colleague I mentioned before, uh, Adam Tu, is that Brest de Tosk is a very progressive modern piece. That I find very astonishing, and there's no such piece in my book. Yeah. So again, it's but they had to raise these expectations because you had lots of German veterans. Yeah. People. Why were they fighting uh, in the in these trenches? And this is a it's a more global problem. Yeah. So. They had to deal with that. And because they had to deal with these expectations, it was all the harder to, do go, to go into a real reform mode. Yeah? For example, Lord George uh, gave this very strategic speech where he said, look, the British Empire is already a League of Nations. He didn't use the word hierarchy, but he said, it's wonderful. You have a mother country that sets the, the pace. Some need some more time to learn how to look after their own affairs, and we will tutor them and guide them. Others are more further along, the dominions, yeah? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it how the entire world should be? And, you know, guess how Indian nationalists and, and the young Gandhi who came to Paris looked at this kind of rhetoric, yeah? So, and, and they had sometimes more realistic expectations than others because they knew that they were not about to be given, yeah, independence and just had to ask nicely in, in a nice rhetorical way. They knew that it was a very hard struggle; would be a very hard struggle. Yeah? So, so I'm, I'm uh, there, there is a chapter nine where I'm trying to uh, systematically compare these kinds of I call it a hierarchy of expectations. Great. Okay. Um, Brendan, <clears throat> congratulations um, on the book. Um, like Andrew, I haven't read all of it yet, but I have read <laughs> a fair bit of it. But like him, I've read your um, unfinished 
uh, is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've got two questions. One relates to uh, the relationship between the two books. So mm -hmm. You said that um, the two were part of a trilogy, mm -hmm. if I it correctly, but of course, chronologically, yes. this new book incorporates yes. the previous book. It's not sort of, yeah, it's sort of two, not one, two, three, as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, not having, as I say, uh, got as far as the 1920s. Um, has your, your thinking on the 1920s at all shifted mm -hmm. in the 10 plus 15 years mm -hmm. uh, between the two books? Um, that would be interesting to know. The second question relates to your argument about the overwhelming fact of Anglo American dominance and also implicitly, I suppose, of international capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what people were reacting mm -hmm. against. That's the question. The point you make about Hitler, that, that is what. Yes, I mean, you are. Um, written about uh, this very well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. But there would be some who wouldn't accept that, mm -hmm. who might say something like actually, this is all about um, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. about the threat of communism, yes. both for Hitler, but also for, for, for the dominant mm -hmm. forces. Now, you, you're quite clear, I did read that. Uh, you're quite clear, actually, Bolshevism, although it's there, it's significant in a way, but yes. it's not really that important. Yeah. Either for the, those who make the rules or those who are getting yeah. adopted. Mm -hmm. Can you but to persuade yes. yeah. the audience mm -hmm. yeah. saying that they would be that they might send yeah. <laughs> yeah. in the other direction? How, yeah. how would you yeah. no, two, two very, very uh, intriguing questions. And and on the first one, in a in a strange way, so I've tried to incorporate my uh, let's say amended but not fundamentally changed thinking on the 1920s in the epilogue of this book. So this is sort of to lead them towards. If you if you haven't read any of the books yet, start with this and then <laughs> read the other, but don't. Uh, um, so uh, it has changed to an extent, but not let's say not fundamentally. I have to say the more I've written now about the the difficulties and the problems of not just making peace after this great war, but dealing with this legacy of the what I consider a, you know this period of immense uh, yeah sort of um, yeah it's it's a period of of unlimited competition driven by capitalism great power rivalry and you know th this is the period when you you had this <coughs> yeah so you have these these crass uh, Darwinistic speeches not uttered by extremists but by a very moderate uh, British Prime Minister Salisbury yeah who is all of a sudden talking of the rising and dying nations. And think of all the others who went, you know, who uh, this is the, the kind of breeding ground for a lot of extremist ideologies uh, in the long 20th century. So if you think about all of this and then add what I tried to describe in chapter seven, how this was escalated during the war, yeah, how you had, uh, for example, you had a, an Anglo German, you know, sort of understanding before the war that one could maybe get, get some deal, you know, get some understanding. You had Lot of young Germans coming to Oxford and Cambridge and so on, you had this kind of idea that maybe we can sort of deal with this in a civilized way. Then, of course, partly because of unrequited love, you have this atrocious, you know, so the, the, there's a great German book called The War of the Philosophers by Peter Hörres. I don't know if it's been translated. It shows how from the German side and from the English more than British side, it's uh, they they become the their worth, the, the, the most hated enemies. So because the, for the German side, it's this perfidious British idea that somehow they did not want them on an equal par in the world. Yeah, and so they, it's the perfidious English who cannot be trusted. And you have all these, you know, they're, they're, uh, this is in the book. I mean, I, I could go on. And on the English side, too, you have this all of a sudden, it's the Prusso German militarism that will do sort of doom the world. And you could take the position of Neil Ferguson that this was all very unfortunate, but that doesn't get us very far. <laughs> Um, so, um, so in that sense, what I, I would say the 1920s are even more remarkable because despite all of this and the problematic 1919, you have this period after 1923 when quite some interesting steps are being taken with American support in the background, but mainly by Europeans who are trying to, yeah, like uh, the first Labour Prime Minister, MacDonald, later someone like Austin Chamberlain, but also all those kinds of British inter English internationalists and liberals who really want, didn't want to have an, an enmity with Germany uh, for over, you know, forever, but to say we need to, we need to bring them into a kind of new concert, yeah. So this is something I think that's very important because um, 
you mentioned the interwar period. I don't use that word. I talk of the post World War or post First World War period. Yeah, because for them there was no clear. This is the thinking that oh, it, it had to become an, another war. On the contrary, if you think of the world around 1926, you can write. You know, you can always say oh, this is all deceptive. But this is, I think, very flawed. You have to understand that they made a lot of efforts in the 1920s to go much beyond the kind of acrimony of 1919. And think of the timing. These are just a few years after a massive catastrophe. Think about how long, I mean, Britain now this year has dealt brilliantly with the Brexit. I'm very impressed, but it's taken some years. I'm joking. Yeah, so it takes a long time for, for something. You know, imagine the catastrophe of the, yeah, of the, of the Great War. So it's, I find it all the more remarkable. And then you have the next big crisis shattering yeah, these new structures that have already been put in place, but are just not as firm yet as they could have been. So in that sense, my, I, I, I feel my first book is sort of vindicated. I would have given it an even more emphatic title, maybe. Um, but maybe that's just my own tunnel vision. <laughs> um, so on the second, can you remind me briefly? Um, it's on the fear of Bolshevism. Ah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I have... Um, uh, a chapter it's called you know it's, is it a formative threat the bolshevism and my my main argument is not that you know this has been completely misunderstood or misinterpreted i simply think that because of the kinds of you know also generational context in which scholars have written about this period you have a whole you know from arno meyer to you know sort of generations after 1945 for them the key event was this Cold War, and so they were trying to see, so where did this start? And if you then get into the habit of having almost on equal terms, something like Lenin rising as the Bolshevik leader and Wilson rising as the first iteration of the kind of liberal capitalist leader, then you have a lot of problems because in terms of you know, what Wilson was thinking about for most of the war, Lenin was very peripheral. And in terms of Lenin, yeah, he didn't even know yet that he would be in a position not just to write very important pamphlets and literature on, yeah, on uh, where he's really a force, but actually in a position to implement this and to foment something like a world revolution. This does become very important from, yeah, for some time after end of 1917 and then into 1919, but it's, it's immediately used by all the parties to pursue the other end. So the Germans use it to say, if you don't give us a more lenient peace, we will go over to the Bolsheviks, or they might take over, there might be a revolution. And um, so similarly, um, I, I find one has to show what exactly the relevance of this threat was. And it was important, but it is not the key to understanding either Wilson or the per Peace of Paris, or even the shape of, the, of Europe after um, 1919, because for a long time, you know, it's very clear the, the, the Bolsheviks, they are very absorbed by even establishing a modicum of control in Russia. Yeah, so this for a long time keeps them occupied. By 1925, you have a certain Stalin saying Locarno is a joke, but the, uh, but the Soviet Union is a very passive power. Yeah, they're not preparing the, to take over the world at all. This changes only in the 1930s and even then, you have these, you know, the period when Stalin decapitates most of the, the potential of the Soviet Union. So I would point to Steve Kotkin's work if you want to know, you know, what is going on. But it's basically, a, it's a quite a different trajectory. Yeah? So the kind of Soviet Union that emerges only because of the Second World War and through the Second World War is not one that was on a kind of linear path towards the contending world power. And, and, and finally, uh, think of Wilson. Yeah? So if you take a more left-leaning Marxist or neo-Marxist view, and I would include Adam Toos in this, it's the United States becomes the biggest capitalist power. So they, of course, have to set the terms. But is this what really happened? I think Wilson had no understanding and no patience for econo using economic leverage in 1919. So, Britain was very indebted, France was very indebted, they wanted more American capital, he could have played if he had been the great capitalist leader, he says this at one or two instances, oh we have them in our hands because we can yeah, do this or that, but they don't do anything because they are politically constrained, 
Congress is not willing to play such games. Congress is not willing to give capital or to with, withhold capital. So uh, yeah, it's, a, it's more a political history, which has a lot to do with economic power, but it also has a lot to do with the political structure in which economic power actually translates. And this brings me back to your point earlier. So for me, this idea that an international system works once the United States can impose its terms, this is not my book. So if you're interested in that kind of theory, you can read my book as a refu refutation because as I mentioned earlier, I think what, what is very, so what, what makes for the new quality of the kind of Pax Atlantica is that yes, the United States is the far superior power, but it is a, in Paul Schroeder's word, a more, words, a more benign hegemon because it allows consultation, it allows cooperative structures, it allows, for example, Britain to have a national health service, which is not the most American kind of way to go. If you think of Western Germany, there's the social market economy. It's not a rapid, you know, it's not a, a liberalized American economy. It allows France to pursue a state-centered kind of economic recovery. So it has much more to do with a certain generation's, I would say, rather broad view on what it means to be a hegemon. And that's not an empire by invitation. Yeah, this is a very common. Uh, sort of uh, view, because for me, empire in the end has something to do with one center making the decisions and finding ways to manipulate or to impose its will. And this is precisely not what characterized, in my view, the, this kind of Atlantic system. And this is also the kind of, yeah, the, this is the kind of system that I think, yeah, that when the question arises uh, to your other point, can this be globalized? Uh, yeah, this is what we need to focus on. It's not about is American power sufficient. Yeah, it's about how do how how are those who are wielding it act? Yeah, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis others, hierarchically, cooperatively. How do they use this kind of power? Okay. That's the question. Much as I would love to follow Sorry. up that question of empire myself, we do have um, some people who would like to ask questions, and we're starting to get to the point where we're running out of time. Um, First question to uh, KJ Chen, and then I've got John, and then Scott. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I haven't read your book, but uh, I can't wait to get answered by asking you because uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, can we apply such Atlantic order to an area beyond Atlantic, mm -hmm. particularly to the Atlantic? Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. uh, you said during the uh, 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 the long 20th century, uh, you say that uh, the Pacific is an American land. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a competition game between the US and the UK in terms of leadership mm -hmm. and, uh, and with uh, yes. fragile relations uh, mm -hmm. you know, within the uh, common wars and uh, America has always broken lines in South Korea, yes. and Taiwan, and uh, yes. Japan. Yes. So uh, even the platform it was the Pacific, but the main, the main players, mm -hmm. they were from the Atlantic. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. the Yeah, yeah. And so for this, uh, I, I, I hope you can look forward to my next book because that's uh, where it really, but, but it, no, it matters in this book because it's precisely, yeah. So what I'm trying to do in this book is always to put the Atlantic developments in relations with global and other regional developments. And because if you're dealing with the US, it's absolutely natural. Yeah. So for them, in the at the dawn of the 20th century after 1860 the big frontier is also trade with europe and all that but it's mainly the pacific frontier yeah it's the pacific frontier it's to open up ever so nicely yeah in a very imperialistic way japan and especially to get a hold on the chinese market and so for for the kinds of actors i'm just describing in the first part of the book the world is very much yeah it's a it's a global competition but the main centers of gravity uh, yeah, it's the Atlantic trade, but that's not the dynamic uh, one, although it's also very dynamic uh, with, uh, with Germany and the United States becoming the two most dynamic economic powers in the world, but mainly for the US, but also for others, it's, it's the Pacific. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's also the, exactly where I'm trying to then distinguish between yeah, the kinds of interests that these powers pursued and the will they had actually to have an order yeah, that had the same principles and had the same rules as the kind of order that they, tr they, they that emerged in the Euro-Atlantic sphere. And here, from the beginning, you can have people like Theodore Roosevelt. So he's thinking of 
yeah, a kind of league, an imperialist league yeah, of policing powers. Later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will come back to this with the four policemen. So clearly for someone like Roosevelt and for yeah, uh, Chamberlain, Joseph Chamberlain, others, they want Japan, yeah, a, a kind of Japan that proves that it can be in this kind of league to be there, not quite equal, but yeah, fellow policing power as long as it does not threaten too many of their interests. So when Japan eventually in the 1930s and particularly um, through the, yeah, the, military, the needs of the military regime and other, other areas plays a different game in China, that's when it's the confrontational side. But in the 1920s and from 1919, you have these tendencies to say, we have to do more integration with the Weimar Republic and to have peace in Europe. And we have through the Washington system, yeah, in 1921, 1922, we have to find naval agreements with Japan to keep Japan smaller, yeah, but to recognize that it's a power in the Pacific and to offer China at least something that looks a bit like a Magna Carta, as it's called. Yeah, so Chinese sovereignty, it's a nice idea, but let's not make it too sovereign. Yeah, so but but there are steps taken, and you have um Japan, for example, Japanese uh, uh, politicians being trained, or they were they're called to to you know, Yale, my, where I worked for a long time, has a, has a proud uh, Chinese and Japanese kind of yeah, connection. Of course, they thought that they would be trained in the more Protestant, uh, Western American Anglo ways. Yeah? And, and so they are sometimes disappointed that their disciples have too many ideas of their own. Yeah, but nonetheless, this is a very important uh, nexus for, for the United States and for Britain as well, of course. Yeah? Mm, yeah. And then after the Second World War, you have the, the new attempt where I think under the pressures of the Cold War, you have two very different systems emerging. You have this Pax Atlantica and you have a US alliance system in East Asia, which is much more hierarchical. I mean, where you have the US being the central actor, it has bilateral yeah, kind of relationships where it clearly imposes yeah, sets the rules vis-a-vis -vis Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and it's not really yeah, uh, consulting on, on policy making with these partners. And I think this has a lot to do with longer term yeah, assumptions, uh, not least generated through the war, that have racial connotations, that have all kind. you know, think of how the United uh, US efforts to dehumanize Japan during the Second World War on a completely different level from those to the dealing with <laughs> Germany. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and one could go on about this. So, so the, 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 the Atlantic order is also a kind of vehicle to show what is not really global, okay. yeah, but, but what could potentially be global. Yeah. Okay, we've got, let's um, raise your hand if you've got a question. Um, I've got two people who have already raised their hands, so we'll get to them and then see if we have time for one more question after that. Um, John. Uh, um, thank you. I'm a bit uh, at a loss, really, because um, this is obviously such a huge subject and uh, covering it, so I can just sort of pull one or two threads. Um, but one of them is, is simply that, I mean, uh, change over time, and it, it seems, you know, obviously, in this more or less two centuries, there's fantastic changes in the world, and in particular, in the distribution of power, which is so relevant to international relations. And, and that uh, seems to me to be happening at the moment in a very dramatic way. Um, and um, so, um, um, one question would be about the level of analysis and explanation, and how far these more structural factors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would then, as Andrew knows, I've written about Wilson, but I'm always arguing. Forget about Wilson. <laughs> he's not that important. Mm -hmm. um, he's a politician right. operating in a political context. Yes. You need to understand the context. That's um, the, um, the thing which we can perhaps take away from this flux of history are concepts. Um, order is one of the is perhaps more enduring. And so, um, if we're having this shifting power balance now, which is, seems to me arguably a shifting power against the West, mm. um, how can we make it orderly and conflict free? Mm. And what could be learned from history about that? 
and I just offer a couple of points. <coughs> I mean, one is that the stable European order of 1945 to the end of the 20th century depended upon Western acquiescence in Soviet domination of, of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So there is a tension between the aspirations order and the aspirations realized in that context. And that has to be faced. And, and also, if there is a, and this is where perhaps the concept of Europe is relevant, if there is a, <coughs> an effort to avoid conflict by concerted action by great powers. That means you can't always have your own way and mm -hmm. surrender to a visit where what China thinks the international order should be mm -hmm. and looking for areas of common <coughs> which are generally common interest mm -hmm. um, rather than simply assuming everybody has to play by the game by the rules mm -hmm. yes. uh, we lay down. <laughs> Absolutely. So may I um, engage with this on two levels? So on one, as briefly as possible. As briefly as possible. Yeah, yeah. So, so on one, uh, in the introduction to there's a part on my methodology, and I am trying to suggest that I'm trying to write an integrated or comprehensive international history, which means that I am interested in agencies and actors and their ideas and what they could do. But I'm also interested in the world, the structure, yeah, the kind of yeah, the kind of longer term factors, forces they had to deal with. And I'm trying to uh, illuminate this through the changing nature of politics. So for example, taking Wilson and many others, they have a certain leeway, they have a power to suggest, but they also have to deal with ever more complex legitimation requirements, support requirements. They cannot do the kind of things that the uh, statesmen mainly at the Congress of Vienna could do, who could you know, sort of deal with their monarchs. They did not have to gain the support apart from Castlereagh um, of parliaments or wider publics you know, and deal with these expectations. I'm also though trying to put into context these state actors and non-state actors, because I think that there's been a very deplorable trend of having this kind of bifurcated history of some people writing transnational history, not interested in states and power anymore, and others who are trying to go back to old fashioned diplomatic history. So I'm trying to put all these, I'm, I'm basically just suggesting they all were inhabiting one world. So if we, if we try to understand why so many liberal you know, activists were disappointed in 1919, we have to understand the power structures of that time and so on. So, so I, I very much uh, uh, also try to, to say in the end, this is not just something about larger forces and impossibility of peacemaking, but action matters and ideas matter and, and consistency matters and avoidance of hypocrisy matters. And this takes me briefly to the present. So uh, the book is less of a book to say, so what shall we do at this very moment? This, it explains more how, do, how did we get to this uh, sort of state of affairs. And I do think that we think of 1989. So Mary Sorotti has written about this, others have tried to grapple with this, Ivan Krastev, I think in a very interesting way. So yeah, so you had, remember, we started out with wonderful debates about the end of history. What a nonsense, yeah? So now history has returned. In my book, it's never been away, yeah? So <laughs> this is the first starting point where uh, it, it took, you know, if you have rather a successful model and societies that seem to think, well, why can't everyone be more like us? That's especially an American kind of trope, yeah? Mm. So, and then think of the learning that it takes to actually understand that you have to renegotiate the rules if we're thinking about the wider world, yeah? And, and I would say we are, we've lived through a, a decades of missed opportunities, also vis-a-vis -vis Russia. This is not, yeah? so I, I would make a clear distinction between absolutely not making any deals with Putin just because he needs to have a deal, yeah? I think this, uh, if, you, if you want an analogy, uh, I, I, I don't mind saying it. Uh, uh, so to make certain deals with Hitler at a time when he thought he could still gain more power by playing off the weak West against uh, each other uh, was a fallacy. So for me, I would make a big distinction between the short term need to uphold certain values, which certain people fight for at this point against others who brutalize them in every possible way. That is one dimension, but the other is 
if, if you think about all the things that were not done vis-a-vis -vis Russia in yeah, after the humiliating uh, implosion of the Soviet Union, and I was in Moscow in the 1990s, and I remember the time when especially American actors treated this like the new Wild East, where the natives you know, didn't know what was going on and they could exploit it to their heart's content. And they had social science models that would mm. exactly predict what's going to happen in Russia. <clears throat> what a lot of nonsense yet again. Yeah? So this is the kind of learning where, yeah, if you, if you, you sh one should write, if you think of Masha Gessen or others, you have to write the history of how was it possible for a non-entity like Putin to become Putin. Yeah, and this is not just the Russian pathologies, it has a lot to do with the wider world and all those in Germany, in London and elsewhere that have made many, many deals with these kinds of you know, the, 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 the surroundings that we see with Putin. So finally, I, I would say, yeah, this, this is not a, 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 a <clears throat> sort of a call to say, oh, we now need peace at any price or we need to you know, sort of, and we need to deal also with the Chinese in ways that yeah, um, they have to be pleased as well. Should we give them half of Taiwan? I don't know. Yeah, so, but if you're interested in certain rules and standards, then you have to defend them in, in a certain order. And I think if you think of all the Russians who are now fleeing to Romania, to Turkey, and, and who are interested in these values, or think of Tiananmen Square, yeah, then I'm not saying that has to be a Western model, but we should not just uh, essentialize yeah, whole civilizations, because that's the beginning of this book. This was done at the dawn of the 20th century with massive consequences. And finally, again, actions matter. Think of US conduct since September the 11th. Yeah? Think of the ways in which various administrations and wider think tanks, so-called, that didn't do a lot of thinking in my view, yeah, made sort of, they spent billions and trillions in completely futile endeavors that have undermined yeah, the legitimacy of American power uh, in ways that no other power could have done. Yeah, so it's from, in, it's from within. Is that a law of nature? I don't think so. Yeah, so this is a time again where it's, it's about agency and people picking up the pieces and saying, we can do it differently. That's not a recipe for success, but I'd rather see that than yeah, sort of saying, oh, we are now at the, at, the, at, the high, at, the, at the mercy of higher forces and here we are. Let's enjoy it while it lasts. Well, that is as good a place as any to bring things to a close. We had this tour de force of the world today based on this historical interpretation. Your last comment sort of gave a kicking to Fukuyama, which is par for the course these days, but also to Macron, to Putin as Hitler, <laughs> Try uh, to, to George <laughs> W. Bush. Everybody comes in the firing line there. So there's a lot to think about. Um, I know there are more questions on the floor, but we have run out of time. So please come up and ask uh, Patrick your question. Um, we also have an opportunity for you to buy the book. Um, at a discount price. At a discount price. <laughs> Um, and to get it signed by the author. But for now, I'd like you to join me in thanking Patrick for this incredibly stimulating talk and to Leslie for her time. That was great. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thanks so much.